Hey, you guys, gals, and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about the real Gaston Bullock means from season three of Boardwalk Empire. All right. To me, Boardwalk Empire is the best mob show ever, and I thought that Gaston Means, played by actor Stephen Root, was one of the most interesting characters on the show. So I did some research on him, and I found out that the real story is much better than the show. So I wanted to share it with you guys, all right? So let's get into this. Gaston Bullock Means was born July 11th, 1897, on the Means family plantation, Black Welder Spring, near Concord, North Carolina, to William Gaston Means and Coraline Bullock. Gaston Means didn't come from a poor family like so many other men that I cover. His grandfather, W.C. Means, was a wealthy plantation owner before the Civil War. Although the Civil War put a big dent into the family's fortunes, they still had more than most. Gaston's father, William Gaston Means, was a lawyer and the mayor of Concord, North Carolina. Gaston grew up in a large Victorian-style house with his six younger brothers and sisters. Gaston Means was a kind man from day one. He found out at an early age that he was very skilled at lying and loved to tell tall tales. While still a kid, he stole money from his mother's wallet. When confronted, he spun a tale that resulted in the maid being fired. In 1898, Gaston graduated from high school and enrolled in the University of North Carolina where he studied pre-law. He dropped out of the university after his sophomore year and took a job at the Standard newspaper as a local editor and reporter. He stayed at that position for two years before being named superintendent of greater schools in Alba Marie, North Carolina. In 1902, he took a job as a salesman for the Cannon Textiles Mills. Being a salesman, Gaston did a lot of traveling, and he eventually settled in New York. While in New York, he would claim that he was related to former President Teddy Roosevelt, but that was all false. In 1909, he met Elizabeth C. Poole, a 19-year-old from Colorado. She recently moved to New York to study art and met Gaston a few weeks after arriving. Gaston means professed his love to Elizabeth and proposed to her, even giving her a date in July. But when that date arrived, he had an excuse. Now this went on for two years. Gaston continually toyed with her emotions, writing her constantly while on the road, sometimes two letters a day. In March of 1911, Miss Poole was done with being manipulated by means and brought a lawsuit against him for breach of contract and requested $25,000 in damages. In June of 1911, the case was thrown out. Gaston would go on to meet and marry Julie Patterson in 1913 and have two children. After being suspected of some wrongdoing in 1914, he quit his job as a salesman before he was fired. And he took a position as a private detective with the William J. Burns Detective Agency. Gaston kept his clients on the edge. He would spin fantastical stories with layers upon layers of complicated conspiracies that all needed to be investigated for 100 bucks a pop. In 1915, World War I was underway, but America had not yet entered the war. Sometime in that year, Gaston Means was approached by Captain Crowell Boyette, head of German espionage in America, and Means became Agent E-13 for the German government. His job was to spin German propaganda in America. In one expose in the newspapers, he said that American captains were giving German ship schedules to the British Navy. Gaston used the money he received from the German government to rent an entire floor of a New York hotel. He called for a press conference in his suite and charged Charles W. Schwab and J.P. Morgan with violating neutrality laws by manufacturing submarines for England. He even employed men to be spies on the shipyards of New York and relayed his information to the Germans. This did not go unnoticed by the American government or the British government. And when America joined the war, Means was investigated. He volunteered to become a double agent and give information against the Germans, but the government chose not to pursue any criminal charges. In 1914, Mrs. Maud King was introduced to Gaston through his wife. The two women had been friends since their youth, and Mrs. King went on to marry well, very well. James C. King was a lumber baron worth millions. She was 24, and he was 50 years her senior. It seemed like it was a sugar daddy type of relationship at first, with James giving her $10,000 for her education. But they were married in 1901, and she signed an agreement to receive $100,000 instead of being named in the will. When James King died, he left the majority of his money to charity, with $3 million to be spent on a home for older men without a place to live. Being his official widow, Maud sued and was granted an additional $490,000 in cash and income for life from a $400,000 trust fund. When Gaston met Maud, she was being swindled by some English common, and Gaston helped her out. Soon, he maneuvered his way into becoming her trusted financial advisor and eventually moved in with her into her New York mansion. Gaston, along with his father-in-law 
and Brother After Means began to slowly drain Mrs. King of her fortune. In 1917, she became aware of his death, and her new fiancé advised her to terminate her dealings with Gaston. On August of 1917, Gaston Means invited Maud King to visit with his wife and family in Concord, North Carolina. On August 27th, Gaston Means went into town and purchased a revolver. On the 29th, he took Maud on a trip to the woods for a picnic, along with his brother Afton and his wife. That afternoon, Gaston told his brother to take the car and his wife and retrieve something from the home. Gaston and Maud continued their afternoon out. What happened next is a story that only Gaston Means knows. And somehow during their walk, Maud made her way deep into the underbrush where she twisted and snapped her ankle. And then shots rang out. Miraculously, Maud shot herself behind the right ear from a few feet away. When questioned, Gaston said that he had brought the gun to go hunting. Then he said that he put the gun up on the tree limb, and when he turned his back, Maud grabbed the gun and it went off. Two problems. Like I said, Maud was shot in the back of the head, and second, she was definitely afraid of guns and would never go near one. Gaston produced a new will that he said he found in Maud's house that left him all the money. A North Carolina coroner found her death to be accidental when she was buried. But her family got the body exhumed, and another autopsy in Illinois showed that she had broken her ankle before being shot, and there were no powder marks indicating that the gun was not close to her head when it was fired. Gaston Means went on trial for murder. But the Southern jury found the Yankee prosecutors not to their liking, and Gaston Means was found not guilty of murder. An Illinois court later declared the new will forgery, and Means got nothing. Means spent the next few years in Concord. In 1921, Gaston shipped the package to Chicago, supposedly containing $57,000 in cash. But when the package reached its destination and was open, it only contained a block of wood. Gaston Means tried to claim that it was the fault of the Southeastern Express Company and sued. But the case was thrown out after it was revealed that the package weighed the exact same amount when it was shipped and when it was delivered. In 1921, Gaston was hired by his former employer, William Burns, now head of the FBI to be an agent. Soon Gaston was using his position to shake down criminals, promising to make their cases go away for a fee. He took bribes to release liquor from federal warehouses, knowing that if he didn't deliver, his victims would have nowhere to complain. Gaston was making seven bucks a day working for the government, but he employed three servants in his new mansion in Georgetown, and he was driven around by a chauffeur in a brand new Cadillac. In April of 1923, things fell apart for Gaston. Him and the secretary went to Chicago to meet with several bootleggers. One of them was a man named Edward Solomon. Means and his secretary presented themselves as agents of the Department of Justice, complete with badges. Means told Solomon that he could secure for him the position of Federal Prohibition Director of Illinois. He offered the protection of shipments to bootleggers and access to alcohol from federal warehouses. Charles Johnson of Philadelphia traveled to D.C. and met with Means and paid him $19,000 to secure the transfer of a large shipment of booze from one Philadelphia warehouse to another. Means told everyone he swindled that he worked for Andrew Mellon, the Secretary of Treasury. Means always failed to come through with his promises, but he refused to give the money back. Solomon and Johnson took the complaints to the Department of Justice, but not before Johnson went looking for Means with his pistol. In October 1923, Attorney General Harry M. Doherty hired Hiram C. Todd as special counsel to prosecute Means, but he was able to stall the trial until the next year. Harry Doherty himself was under investigation for conspiring to violate the Volstead Act. Means appeared before the Select Committee of the Senate to investigate the Attorney General. He tried to make a cash deal with Doherty in exchange for his favorable testimony, but Doherty declined. Means said that he had two suitcases worth of evidence, and he turned them over to two men who presented themselves as Senate Sergeant of Arms. When the suitcases were brought into the courtroom, they contained no evidence. Gaston Means stood up in the courtroom and said, I have been tricked by my enemies. I will run them down if it's the last thing I do. He was charged with perjury. His bootlegging trial started in June of 1924, and to save himself, Means tried to implicate his old friend, Jess Smith, in the payoff scheme. He didn't stop there. He also implicated Harry Darty, Andrew Mellon, and even the deceased President Harding as the men he worked for. Means was found guilty of perjury, in his second trial, he was found guilty of violating the Sullivan Act and was sentenced to four years and a $10,000 fine. Gaston Means was sent off to federal prison in Atlanta. He quickly became friends with the warden and spied on other inmates for him, so he did his time in relative comfort. He was released in 1928 and returned to Concord, North Carolina. In 1930, he teamed up with a writer and wrote a bestseller, The Strange Death of President Harding. In his book, he said that President Harding's wife poisoned her husband after she found out about a child he fathered with a young woman named Nan Britton. On March 1st, 1932, 
the 20 month old son of aviator Charles Lindbergh was kidnapped from his bedroom in East Amwell, New Jersey. For weeks, every gangster of note from around the country was brought in and questioned about the kidnapping. A few days after the kidnapping, Gaston Means was approached by Evelyn Welsh McLean, an extremely wealthy woman and friend of the Lindberghs. She heard he knew the kidnappers and asked for his help to get the baby back. Means told her that a former cellmate asked him to be part of the conspiracy before it happened, but he declined it. But he was sure he knew who the kidnappers were. He told her that for $100,000, he could get the kidnappers to return the baby. Now, the original ransom was only $50,000. He set up a meeting and hired a hard-faced man to play the role of a member of the kidnapping gang. He told her that the baby was in El Paso, Texas. The next day, Evelyn McLean was at her bank withdrawing $100,000 and 50 and $100 bills. She gave Means the money, and he said that it would be necessary for her to come to El Paso, Texas with him, because the baby was in Mexico. When they got to Texas, the story changed again. Now Means' hard face associate said that he needed another $4,000, and she had to come with him to Mexico to get the baby. At this point, McLean got cold feet and returned to D.C. After several attempts to get her money back, she went to the Department of Justice. Gaston Means was arrested and charged with embezzlement. Even after the body of Charles Lindbergh Jr. was identified by his father, Means insisted that the child was still alive in Mexico. Gaston Means was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years. He was sent back to Atlanta to do his time. In December of 1938, Gaston Means was transferred to Leavenworth for a gallbladder operation, and he died due to complications of the surgery on December 12, 1938. Gaston Means said of himself, I am entirely aware of the fact that I am regarded as a consummate liar, but it is difficult for the lay mind to distinguish between trained dissimulation and lying. And that, my friends, is the skinny on Gaston Bullock Means. I hope you guys enjoyed the story as much as I enjoyed telling it. To all my Boardwalk fans, I hope you learned some things. And um, so I'm still working on the next episode, the next big episode. And I, I got a question for you guys. I want to know, would you rather have one long video or two half hour, 40 minutes so videos? So let me know in the comments. And uh, if you pick the longer one, then it's going to take a little longer. But I'll, I'll drop something in between. Um, but if you pick the shorter one, I can have it out for you for next week. All right. Um, make sure that you click that subscribe button. Break that thumb. Ring that bell. Set it for all notifications. Go down to the merch store. Grab yourself a shirt. Get yourself something nice. If you want to send the envelope upstairs to the boss, the link is down below. If you want to officially become a member of the Few Bad Men crew, hit that join button. For two bucks a month, you can become a made guy or made gal. I want to thank everyone who, who slipped the envelope upstairs to the boss last month. Thank you. From the uh, Cash App to the PayPal donation, thank you guys so much. Like I said, it's not about the money. It's more about, you know, like the love. And I do appreciate everybody who helps out. Even just, you know, if you can't help out, just watching the video all the way through helps me out a lot. All right? So, this has been A Few Bad Men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.